Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, our webinar is entitled Advanced Pattern Recognition in the GIFX Comprehensive. Our presenter is going to be Dr. Warren Brown. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Brown. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Good to be here. Nice. My name is, as Dr. Warren said, my name is Dr. Lenore Powell, and I'm a medical education specialist here at Genova's Atlanta branch, and I will serve today as your moderator. And we would like to welcome Dr. Warren Brown. Um, he's basically earned his doctorate from the School of Naturopathic Medicine at Bastyr University in Seattle, Washington. He then completed an 18-month clinical residency program in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, Dr. Brown also completed additional coursework in functional medicine and has spoken at functional and integrative medicine conferences across the United States on the topic of laboratory testing. Um, in his work with Genova Diagnostics, um, Dr. Brown enjoys um, consulting with practitioners from all medical disciplines, providing the support needed to help improve clinical outcomes. And in his private practice, Dr. Brown helps athletes and active individuals to reach their highest levels of health and performance through his advanced clinical approach. And as everybody is well aware, with the current um, pandemic, um, prompting clinicians to move to more non-acute patient appointments through telemedicine. Just as a reminder, we still do offer many non-invasive testing through urine, saliva, blood spot, stool collection packs that can be shipped directly to your patients for specimen collection at home. And you can actually complete the requisition online as well. So for, for more information, please visit my GDX um, account. So I'm going to pass over the role of presenter to Dr. Brown. All right. Are you seeing my screen, the title slide, Dr. Powell? I see your screen, the title slide, everything. We're good. Great. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for uh, joining us today. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to uh, join us for this webinar. I'm calling this webinar Advanced Pattern Recognition. That means we'll be moving through these slides pretty quickly with a focus on patterns. So if you're new to specialized testing like this and uh, looking for some more foundational knowledge about the test, uh, you'll find a lot of additional information in that support guide that Dr. Powell linked. Uh, and you'll also find that on our website, gdx.net. So uh, now that I've said hello, I'm going to switch off my webcam here. Uh, just might make things a little simpler okay. here presentation wise. All right. So are you still seeing my screen, Dr. Powell? Yes, sir, it looks great. Okay, great. All right, let's, let's jump right in here. So objectives for today, pretty simple. We're going to be uh, reviewing some of the pattern recognition tools that are included in the GIFX uh, report. I'll also be providing some case-based examples so that you can see a variety of different types of results. And then we'll talk about coming up with treatment plans based on results, based on these patterns. A few caveats before we get really get into it here. I have to mention that uh, this is, we're focused on patterns here. So there inevitably will be some exceptions to these rules and that some patients can have more than one pattern at a given time. Generally, it's best practice to interpret any laboratory test result within the context of the patient. And the GIFX comprehensive is a great test, uh, lots of data there, but it's not meant to entirely replace a conventional medical workup. So there still is a place for that. And also this presentation is meant to augment, but not replace any good clinical judgment on your part. So. Uh, with that in mind, we're ready to jump into our first case. I'm calling this one maldigestion. It's a maldigestion pattern because of impaired digestive secretions, uh, because of the low pancreatic elastase. So uh, that is sort of the, the uh, overview here. And this was a case in a 40-year-old female. She had uh, frequent abdominal pain, long-standing issues, um, bloating, fullness, uh, loose stools, mostly refined carbohydrates in the diet. She had a lot of work and family stress. Previously had tried an elimination challenge diet with limited symptom relief. 
and she denies any smoking or alcohol. I mentioned that as part of the history because of the low pancreatic elastase that we're going to see in a moment. Um, those are things that could impact pancreatic function. So uh, she was not smoking or, or drinking alcohol. And she had a conventional GI workup, which was pretty much unremarkable. She was labeled as IBS and said, here, take a PPI and, and you know, see if that helps. So unfortunately, it wasn't helpful for her. On this, uh, on this slide here, on the right side, we see a screenshot of the first page of the GI effects report. So uh, right away, we're seeing within these pattern recognition tools that are included in the report that the scoring system there at the bottom of that, uh, of that graphic there indicates maldigestion is the most significant issue here. So it's the primary issue according to the numbers, and, and in this case, I completely agree with that. A few other things from her test. Uh, this is uh, the, a clipping from the fourth page of the report. There was a very low pancreatic elastase. If it's below 100, it's a pretty severe insufficiency of pancreatic exocrine function. Uh, interestingly, we did not see high products or high fecal fats. They were normal, in fact. And uh, you're probably thinking, well, with a low elastase, why wouldn't there be some fat and protein maldigestion? But we have to think back to the diet. And this was a patient who was eating mostly carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates. And uh, th these are, you know, sometimes it's a little more difficult to see protein and fat maldigestion when somebody's not consuming any protein or fat. So when we look at the commensal bacteria page in her report, we see many low and borderline low commensal bacteria. So that includes low lactobacillus, borderline low bifidobacterium, acromantia was also low. And uh, this is probably a consequence of a diet that's lacking complex carbohydrates and resistant starches and fiber. Uh, she was eating mostly simple refined carbohydrates. So that might be part of the reason why we didn't see very much robustness here in the commensal bacteria. Uh, just as a reminder, commensal bacteria means bacteria we expect to see in the gut and they make up part of the microbiome. So um, one other thing here, um, well, let's go to the next slide actually here. So in coming up with a treatment plan for this patient, uh, we think about some digestive enzyme support, so 10,000 units of a broad spectrum digestive enzyme. Uh, you may go with a pretty robust dose of probiotics, 50 billion sounds pretty robust to me. Um, you, you, you could also think about increasing whole plant-based foods in the diet, which might give her some more uh, fiber and prebiotic, which could be supportive of the commensal bacteria. And also our, our, um, our support materials mentioned things like mindful eating. And, and this was a patient who was carrying a lot of stress. So if she's eating in that sympathetic dominant state where she's carrying a lot of stress, it could make it a little harder for her to make the appropriate amount of digestive secretions. So that's the importance of, of um, you know, eating in a, in a place where you can actually reach that parasympathetic state, uh, which that's where we do our resting and digesting. We do want to follow up on that pancreatic elastase. Uh, it was severely low, so we would check it again in you know, one to three months wouldn't be unreasonable. You could consider some serum assessments looking at the pancreas like amylase, uh, serum amylase, maybe even trypsin. Um, and you may even consider a GI referral if that pancreatic elastase is not improving, because if there's something wrong with the pancreas, we could potentially see a decline of the exocrine function of the pancreas. Uh, let's see here. So, I mean, you know, worst case scenario, if there's something really wrong with the pancreas, I mean, patient might have jaundice or, or, or weight loss or uh, poor appetite, nausea, vomiting, 
um, you know, any abnormalities on, a, on an abdominal exam, I think might be warning signs and might be something that prompts a referral to a conventional gastroenterologist a little more quickly. Uh, that's maybe a good transition into this little sidebar we're going to take here. Uh, is something maldigestion or malabsorption and what's the difference? Uh, I think there is some merit to trying to figure out the difference between the two because sometimes that can change the treatment direction and some patients can have both. So a couple general concepts here about maldigestion. Usually this involves problems breaking down macronutrients. So this would apply to the chemical and bio, the, the, the chemical and mechanical aspects of digestion. So is the patient chewing their food completely? Are they making enough digestive secretions to, uh, to help break down that food? And that would mean things like bile, uh, hydrochloric acid, and enzymes. If they're not releasing enough of those, then supporting in those areas might help them to, uh, might help them to digest their food a little better. Malabsorption is a, a little bit different. That usually has something to do with the, the gut barrier and the absorptive surface of the gut being compromised. So we see this a lot in patients with SIBO where bacteria can interfere with the absorptive process in the small intestine. We see this in inflammatory bowel disease where that, that gut uh, lining is inflamed. And uh, we might see that if the patient had any GI surgeries that removed or altered the absorptive surface. Uh, that might be a good transition into a few very quick inflammatory bowel disease patients here um, because that would be possibly a malabsorption issue. Generally, an inflamed gut uh, will have a more difficult time absorbing because the absorptive surface is compromised. So uh, with that said, you might see high fecal fats detected in, in patients with IBD, um, but you know, we look at these inflammatory markers um, first and foremost. Um, First case here, 55-year-old male. This was somebody who had been diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease, but hadn't had a flare in the last five years. He had been doing some work to clean up his diet and take better care of himself, manage his stress levels, et cetera. And, um, and we can see his calprotectin, which is the neutrophil type of inflammation, and the fecal secretory, or the uh, eosinophil protein X, which is the IgE type of inflammation in the gut were normal. Another patient, a 34-year-old female with a history of inflammatory bowel disease who had flares every two to three months or so, uh, wasn't currently in flare at the time of specimen collection, but we see a borderline calprotectin there. So it's telling us there is some neutrophil mediated inflammation here. And uh, she might be about to be in flare in her next flare, or she might be coming down from her previous flare. It's hard to know, but there is some uh, calprotectin elevation here. The other inflammatory bowel disease case here, a 19-year-old female, she had not been diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease at the time of the test, but as you can see from the calprotectin and eosinophil protein X, they're just really elevated here. So. Uh, this would be uh, a referral to a GI specialist, especially if she had any acute uh, symptoms. I would imagine, you know, with uh, calprotectin this, this high, if you see this, a uh, patient will usually be presenting with uh, diarrhea, maybe blood in the stool, um, lots of abdominal pain. So those kinds of things in, in somebody with a very elevated calprotectin and eosinophil protein X, would be uh, some warning signs. And uh, you know, it's, it's always important to put all the cards on the table, so to speak, and, and know what we're dealing with uh, because that can help us make a more effective uh, treatment plan. So um, not every, with that said, not every inflammatory bowel disease patient will present like this, but these are some common, common patterns that you might see. Um, not every inflammatory bowel disease patient is the same. Couple of other quick observations and key points here. 
uh, when inflammatory uh, biomarkers are elevated, there's often going to be some other area of gut dysfunction along with that, whether that's malabsorption or dysbiosis. Um, dysbiosis, we actually have an IAD score included in the GIFX comprehensive on the second page of the test. And uh, the significance of that is that if we see a commensal pattern that would be indicated by a high IAD score, uh, that that commensal pattern could be a possible contributor to some of the inflammation in the gut. So that's a, a nice tool that's um, included in the test as well. Um, other, other points here, calprotectin and eosinophil protein X are often elevated together in inflammatory bowel disease patients. And uh, aside from IBD, calprotectin could be elevated if there's a severe gut infection or worst case, uh, a GI cancer. So those, those are reasons to not ignore an elevated calprotectin. Brings us to our next case, a dysbiosis pattern here. So this was a 23 year old male. Chief complaints were anxiety and depression, loose stools and diarrhea as well. Was making mostly good food choices uh, but he was doing frequent takeout and, and restaurant dining. And um, he had a recent diagnosis of IBS, uh, the result of a conventional GI workup. And uh, he maintains regular visits with his psychiatrist. He's pleased with his psychiatric care. He takes a couple of medicines for that. Um, but uh, this, is, you know, this is what the first page looked like. There was uh, some dysbiosis, there was some metabolic imbalance and some infection. So why didn't I call this a dysbiosis, metabolic imbalance, infection pattern? Well, I don't think it'd be wrong to call it that, but I think the primary issue here is dysbiosis, at least in terms of the gut. Um, that did receive the highest score. And I also believe that addressing the dysbiosis here first might lead to improvement in the other two categories metabolic imbalance and infection. Metabolic imbalance, we mean metabolites. Uh, we're talking about metabolites of the gut bacteria. So it would be a gut, gut uh, metabolite imbalance here. This is what the fourth page of the test looked like. You can see short chain fatty acids were in a pretty good position there. He was getting some, some fiber in the diet. He was aware that that those were good foods to eat. And so he, so that his short chain fatty acids seemed to be okay. However, his beta glucuronidase was quite high, 10,000. And in the support materials, you'll see causes of elevated beta glucuronidase could be things like dysbiosis. Somebody who's eating a Western diet or high meat, high protein. Um, he, this was likely coming from some dysbiosis. And um, if, for those of you who don't know, uh, Genova does have a YouTube channel. Uh, up on that uh, channel, uh, I had a, I, I, we've posted a live discussion of beta glucuronidase that was uh, from one of our social media posts. So if you're looking for a, um, some more detail on what beta glucuronidase does and, and how it works, um, you can check out that video. I've linked it here. Um, short story is that it's an enzyme made or induced by the gut bacteria, and it plays a role in recirculating toxins, steroid hormones, and even some medications. So for, uh, for those reasons, we don't want to ignore this either. Uh, we, when we correct dysbiosis, we often see that beta-glucuronidase improves. Looking at the commensal bacteria page for this patient, we're seeing a, uh, uh, you know, some highs and lows here. About a third of the commensal bacteria here are, are abnormal, out of the reference range. And that was also picked up on the third page in this graphic here at the lower left of the slide. Third page of the, of the report, um, shows that the commensal balance is a little bit off. He's a little bit closer to that imbalanced coloring on the spectrum there than the balanced coloring. So it's just some, some other indications in the report that we're looking at a dysbiosis here. 
culture results also showing some signs of dysbiosis and potentially pathogenic organisms. Potentially pathogenic bacillus at a four plus. Pseudomonas was at a four plus as well. We even saw some uh, candida at a one plus. So um, symptoms of bacillus and pseudomonas could be things like loose stool or diarrhea. So it, it does lead to those symptoms in some patients. And that was consistent with his clinical presentation. Um, the candida at a one plus, uh, you're not looking too suspicious here, but if it overgrows in the gut, could lead to things like loose stools, fatigue, mood symptoms sometimes. So a uh, little consistent there, but um, you know, at a one plus doesn't look too suspicious. In terms of coming up with a treatment plan for this patient, a uh, patient wanted to do natural agents. So four to eight weeks is a good amount of time for most uh, potentially pathogenic uh, organisms to be treated successfully with natural agents. So some clinicians stretch that out a little bit longer, but um, so a combination of natural agents wouldn't be a bad idea. Things like berberine, and plant tannins, for instance, had good inhibition for both the pseudomonas and the bacillus that we cultured from his uh, specimen. Um, any of those gray bars that reach at least halfway from left to right would be considered effective. Um, we also think about a multi-strain probiotic, especially bifidobacterium. That was one of his lowest commensals, so uh, could use some support there uh, while trying to treat these potential pathogens. Uh, you could make a uh, consideration for Saccharomyces boulardii in this case, too. He did have some uh, candida, so uh, Saccharomyces boulardii may be able to provide some competitive inhibition to help crowd that out. That wouldn't be an unreasonable thing to consider here. Food hygiene, I mention this because we often forget about this, and patients do too, but minimizing some of the vectors for potentially pathogenic bacteria, he was getting a lot of takeout. Uh, from restaurants, and if food is sitting at danger zone temperatures, room temperatures, um, that pr really does promote the growth of bacteria there. So if he's getting his takeout, spending a long time in the car, sitting on the counter when he gets home and coming to it later, um, you know, that, that could potentially be sources of potentially pathogenic bacteria. Also hand washing, which, uh, you know, in 2020, that's kind of a no-brainer here, but uh, keeping the hands clean and, and some of those practical tips patients forget about. Um, so just a reminder of that can be helpful to some folks. If you're going to follow up with a GI effects, three to six months uh, would be a good time to check back in on things to ensure progress. You might even consider a neutral plasma because uh, he had some mood issues that can uh, we can see amino acid levels and needs for B vitamins, and uh, and then he also had some stress, um, anxiety, so adrenal cortex stress profile with the cortisol awakening response might add a little more context to the case overall, so just some other ideas. Also, I should mention this little blank area that you're seeing above the bacillus sensitivity, uh, that is how it always shows up in the sensitivities. There aren't any prescriptive agents uh, or guidelines for interpreting prescriptive agents for bacillus. So uh, that's why the top of that page looks blank. So if you see bacillus culture out for your patients, it's not an error that there are no prescriptive agents listed there. Brings us to our next case. This is a SIBO methane pattern with maldigestion. I have to say uh, that this test, the GIFX comprehensive, would be suggestive of SIBO, but not diagnostic for it. So to diagnose it, we'd, we'd need the uh, hydrogen and methane breath test. And um, so just initially, we can see some patterns here in the GIFX that would suggest it, but, um, and, and there's more information about that in our uh, support guide too. So you can check that out. But, uh, but this test, the GIFX comprehensive, our stool test would be suggestive, but not diagnostic for it. Jumping into this case, 34-year-old female. She had diurnal bloating that was worse at the end of the day. So the beginning of the day, her pants fit fine, but towards the end of the day, she had to unbutton that top button because of the bloating. And that's uh, pretty 
pretty uh, characteristic for SIBO, especially if there's constipation and gas along with that. She said she had a slight improvement on a low carb paleo diet, which we wonder if, if maybe that might have been because she started to avoid some fermentable carbohydrates and fiber. Often SIBO patients feel a lot better when they're avoiding fiber or on a low FODMAP diet or you know, low carb or paleo diet. It's, it's, you, sometimes you get some symptom relief from that in SIBO because there's, there's not a lot of fiber intake. She had tried pre and probiotics, but symptoms got worse. Another sort of check mark in the SIBO box, so to speak, uh, pre, pro and prebiotics sometimes can aggravate SIBO patients. And uh, conventional GI workup, the working diagnosis was IBS, and she was recommended an SSRI for her anxiety. So um, this is what the first page of the GIFX result looked like. Uh, we see the dysbiosis score has the has the strongest uh, received the strongest um, uh, score there a level of 10 out of 10 and uh, based on that history you might already be asking a question about SIBO so the next thing I usually do when I hear a history like that and I look at a GIFX uh, comprehensive here is I go to the total commensal abundance at the top of page two this is what it looks like. Uh, the total commensal abundance for this patient is on the high side of the healthy cohort, meaning we're seeing about 110% of the bacteria, commensal bacteria that we expected to see. Healthy cohort would be 100%. She was on the high side of that, almost into that microbiome overgrowth territory. So that's telling us we're seeing more commensal bacteria than than uh, the healthy cohort. So there's some element of overgrowth and some of the report commentary uh, reminds us of that. Higher total commensal abundance may indicate potential bacterial overgrowth. You know, the other scenario would be uh, if a patient did not have a lot of symptoms, no SIBO symptoms, and you see an overgrowth like this, it could be a patient who's getting a lot of fiber and fermented foods in the diet and maybe taking a probiotic. So it's not always bad to see it on the high side of the healthy cohort here, but in somebody with symptoms, overgrowth symptoms, SIBO symptoms, uh, it could be a sign. This is what the dysbiosis patterns looked like in the report. The inflammation associated dysbiosis score was pretty minimal. The methane dysbiosis score was up. It was over five. Level of seven there is borderline, suggesting that there is a pattern of commensal bacteria in her in her uh, stool there that looked consistent with methane production. A couple of important things about methane is that it has associations with constipation. It can suppress some of the immune response in the gut, which makes us more vulnerable to opportunistic organisms. And there is emerging published medical literature on a condition called intestinal methanogen overgrowth, meaning that if methane is being produced in high amounts, even in the large intestine, not even in SIBO, but even in the large intestine, it may be a problem. So if you're looking for more explanation on the background behind these dysbiosis patterns and all the work that went into coming up with these calculations, uh, I'd encourage you to check out Dr. Michael Chapman's live GDX from March of 2020. Uh, he goes into great detail about how these scores are calculated and the value of these scores. So the commensal bacteria page did show some signs of overgrowth as well. We're seeing many high commensals. We're also seeing a low lactobacillus here, which is kind of interesting. I always think of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium and even acromantia on this page as some of the ones that might be considered arguably some of the most beneficial organisms to see. And, uh, and here we see lactobacillus is one of the lowest. So I think that is another possible indication of some imbalance here. Anyhow, we also see methanobrevibacter at the upper end of the reference range. So that's the third one from the bottom. 
And uh, that was on the edge of the fourth and fifth quintile. So that was among her commensal bacteria, one of the, one of the higher ones. So seemed to be consistent here with not only her symptoms, but also the methane dysbiosis score. Uh, also, one other thing I should mention, um, Dr. Stubbe's live GDX webinar from October 2018 goes into a lot of detail about SIBO, and it's a great resource, so I, I definitely recommend checking that out. This was the culture results for this patient. Citrobacter and Klebsiella were found here, so we also saw two different kinds of yeast show up here, so some subtle indications of overgrowth even in the culture results here, um, perhaps. We have sensitivities for those organisms, the Klebsiella and the Citrobacter, and looking at those, uh, you could say, well, let's let's treat these potential pathogens and see if we can balance the gut flora, and, and sometimes that works, but uh, the, the clinician wisely said, well, I want to I want to see see what I'm dealing with here, and so uh, considered uh, ordered actually a SIBO test, and uh, we can see that on the first page, that is one of the therapeutic support options mentioned with dysbiosis. I've I've uh, outlined it here on the right side of the slide, but we see consider SIBO testing when the dysbiosis score uh, is elevated, especially if there are SIBO-like symptoms, which would be gas, bloating, um, could be loose stool or constipation, uh, et cetera. So, um, so that, that was mentioned and the SIBO test was ordered. The three hour test, in fact, because this patient did have slower transit time. So she was tending a little more towards constipation. So uh, the three hour test is, is great for that. The test was positive for hydrogen, but strongly positive for methane. So methane did seem to be, um, you know, there were, there, she was making methane. We have a documented positive SIBO test here. And so uh, at that point, you start to think, well, l let's treat. Uh, but if we just treated with antimicrobials, let's say we just looked at the sensitivities on the previous slide, um, we might, we might have part of a SIBO treatment plan and the patient may get a little bit better. But if there's a relapse after that, uh, it could be because the patient needed a, sh a more well-rounded approach to SIBO. And uh, we'll get into that here on the next slide. So here we have the treatments for this case, a temporary low FODMAP diet, which can help to starve out some of the bacterial overgrowth by, uh, by preventing their their food source, basically. If we eat a low FODMAP diet, there's not a lot of fermentable, um, fermentable foods for the gut bacteria to sustain themselves, so uh, that can be helpful for getting rid of overgrowth. Combination of natural antimicrobials was uh, prescribed, so that would be a combination of berberine, oil of oregano, allicin. Allicin seems to be pretty effective for treating methane. Uh, in my experience, and um, and so that would be the antimicrobial that would be needed to help get rid of uh, the overgrowth as well. Uh, D-limonene, or you could use ginger or some other motility agent to help uh, help uh, keep her from becoming constipated again. Constipation can be a predisposing factor for SIBO because if things are moving through the GI tract really slowly, there's a tendency for things to back up. Uh, then we have meal timing. So this can be helpful for reestablishing the migrating motor complex. That uh, is that cleaning wave. It's that electromechanical cleaning wave that has uh, that helps us clear bacteria from the small intestine overnight. And if she's eating late at night, uh, that is making it a little harder for her migrating motor complex. Uh, and then lifestyle aspects of eating. So uh, try, oh, this is another patient where uh, we want to take some time to eat. We want to chew our food completely. We want to not, not um, care, you know, try to, try to have some sort of calming 
activity before meals so that she can get into more of a parasympathetic state when she's eating. Sometimes that can be helpful, can help patients make more digestive secretions and uh, is a good thing to do when eating. Uh, I've used this approach with some good success in my own uh, clinical practice. Um, I, I, if you're looking for more information about this, you could check out Dr. Seibecker's website, seboinfo.com. Great resource if you're looking for more information and treatment ideas. Brings us to our next case. Moving right along here, food sensitivity. Uh, this is another one where the GI effects can give us some clues. Uh, it can't help identify which foods a patient is reacting to. We would need antibody testing for that or, or maybe a structured elimination challenge diet. Uh, but uh, this can provide some clues as to if those would be reasonable next steps for the patient. So this was a 41-year-old female, chief complaint of migraines. She was having some GI symptoms, loose stools, constipation, um, occasional abdominal pain. These were longstanding issues as well. Um, she was pretty health, health conscious and very active. She had even tried a gluten elimination before and uh, helped reduce the frequency of her migraines a little bit, but didn't fully get rid of them. She takes probiotics, magnesium, essential oils, and didn't stop anything prior to the specimen collection, which I would always recommend you follow the specimen collection instructions. But uh, you know, this, is, this is somebody who, who didn't, however, it didn't, uh, it wouldn't uh, interfere with our assay, it wouldn't interfere with the ability to run the test taking these things here. It would influence some of the results, but may not, uh, won't uh, interfere with the equipment or anything. So another uh, healthcare provider had prescribed a tryptin for her, for her migraines, which wasn't helpful. Um, so we look at a GI effects here and on the first page of her result, we see that the fecal secretory IgA in the inflammation box is high. We look at the second page of the test results here and we see a total commensal abundance that's in deficiency territory there. It is lower than the healthy cohort, so fewer commensal bacteria here. Wondering if this might have been influenced by the antimicrobials properties of the essential oils that she was taking. So it's not uh, not all essential oils have antimicrobial properties, but some do, and um, that may have uh, influenced here the total commensal abundance. Um, anytime you see a low total commensal abundance, it could be the result of an antimicrobial or even an antibiotic. It could be a lack of fiber or prebiotics in the diet, and it could also be that the patient's not getting enough fermentable foods. Um, or fermented foods, rather. So those could be reasons for a low total commensal abundance. Looking at the fourth page of her results, we see that elevated fecal secretory IgA. It's high here um, by a substantial margin. And the support materials mention some of the causes for elevated fecal secretory IgA here. That tells us that the immune response in the, in the gut barrier is upregulated, that it's reacting to something. That's what the fecal sig A tells us. So the reasons for that could be things like food sensitivities or potentially pathogenic bacteria. Um, you know, this patient we'll see has, uh, we see right here actually, has some citrobacter. So, um, that could be part of the reason why that fecal secretory IgA is elevated. Sometimes it's multiple reasons. In this case, maybe some food sensitivity and uh, this citrobacter here. So citrobacter doesn't usually cause migraine though. So that does, does make me think that uh, maybe there's some element of, of food sensitivity. Of course, there can be a lot of reasons for migraines, but it does seem to be fairly common. Looking at uh, the, you're sort of looking at this data from page four and reflecting back to the first page, the scores, we can see some therapeutic support options here that, that might be helpful. And I've I've outlined these for you here. So elimination diet, uh, a, a full elimination diet rather than just eliminating gluten. 
Um, food sensitivities often mean that there's some element of intestinal hyperpermeability. So some mucosal support is not a bad idea. We mentioned things like slippery elm. That's one of my favorites. Zinc carnosine and glutamine. So those could be some things to consider, um, given that we're suspicious that there are some food sensitivities and maybe even some permeability here. Prebiotics and probiotics were also mentioned. It's possible that uh, this might be a better solution when somebody has a low commensal abundance. They have fewer commensal bacteria. Um, that it may not make as much sense to go in there and attack a citrobacter with antimicrobials. It might make more sense to build up the microbiome and try to achieve some competitive inhibition from the good commensal bacteria. So building healthier flora can sometimes be an effective strategy for making, it, making things more uncomfortable for something like citrobacter or another potential pathogen. Brings us to the next case here, compound infection. Um, this can happen, particularly when patients aren't making a lot of stomach acid or when stomach acid is being suppressed by a medication. Um, and I'll explain that in the, in the next few slides here. But this, this is a, a gentleman who had a lot of um, infections here in the gut. 62-year-old male. Uh, he had some diffuse abdominal pain with frequent bloating, loose stools, and he had some GERD. He often skips meals and then he overeats and he has lots of work stress. No recent international travel um, and he was taking an H2 blocker and a statin. His colonoscopy as of a year ago was unremarkable, so things seem to be okay there. When looking at the first page of his results, we see that the maldigestion category had some significance, dysbiosis, and infection. So there were quite a few patterns we were being uh, we were picking up on here uh, in the report. But given the amount of abnormal bacteriology and parasitology that we're going to see on the next page, I'm calling this one a, a compound infection case. But uh, truly, there are multiple things going on here. A loss of antimicrobial mechanisms of digestion means, for instance, somebody who's not making enough stomach acid or in situations where stomach acid is being suppressed by something like an H2 blocker. Um, that may be at play here because stomach acid helps to, to, helps to digest and sterilize some of the food that's coming into the body. So if we're suppressing that acid, then we might be, we might see more um, potential pathogens or pathogens um, reach the digestive tract. So we did see two different kinds of parasites, blastocystis and Entamoeba coli. We saw H. pylori was positive. Uh, that's available as an add-on for this test. So the clinician ordered that because the patient was complaining about GERD. Uh, so that's a smart thing to do. Um, that was positive, and we were, um, were just seeing a lot going on here in terms of pathogens and potential pathogens. So let's talk about what some of those could do to the patient symptom-wise. Well, H. pylori, uh, we see GERD, nausea, abdominal pain, bloating. Uh, we see blastocystis here, diarrhea, abdominal pain, bloating. Citrobacter and Pseudomonas associated with diarrhea and exocrine pancreatic insufficiency because of he had a low pancreatic elastase, also some of the same symptoms. So uh, you, you kind of look at these findings and you're thinking, well, you're not asking why the patient has symptoms, but why not? There's so much going on here. I should also mention, I didn't include uh, from in this table the Entamoeba coli, which uh, you, if, you're, if you were paying attention, you saw that here in the, in the parasitology results. Entamoeba coli is not considered a pathogen according to the CDC, so uh, that's why I didn't include it in the table here. So for this, I have to mention the CDC recommendations here. Um, 
these are some guidelines for treating H. pylori from a conventional perspective. And uh, triple or quad therapy is usually what we hear most about. And it's a combination of some of the agents that are listed here on the slide. I really liked that the CDC even acknowledges that there is some individuality that should factor into treatment. So I thought that was really uh, nice to see. They say H. pylori treatment should be determined on an individual basis. So in other words, there's not a blanket treatment for it that's right for everybody. So looking at some potential next steps here. So we wanna rule out an ulcer. That's always a good thing to do, um, especially if the patient has symptoms of that. And that could be, you know, usually they'll report a dull achy pain in the upper abdomen or maybe nausea, vomiting, maybe uh, reflux or strong heartburn. Um, so it's always good to know if the patient's got an ulcer or not. So I think some due diligence there could be helpful and that could determine, that could help you determine how important it is to treat the H. pylori. You could consider treating H. pylori according to the CDC guidelines, or uh, there's a natural agent approach outlined in Dr. Thomas Williams' book. Uh, the reference is there at the bottom right of the slide. It's functional strategies for the management of gastrointestinal disorders. Um, I've used that approach uh, successfully in a few patients, and it's uh, it's just uh, it's uh, that book is a great resource. I highly recommend it. Um, you could consider some antimicrobials to treat the potentially pathogenic bacteria and the blastocystis. Um, you could support with some enzymes here that, that looked to be a good idea because of the low pancreatic elastase. And of course, we always wanna find out why it's low. Uh, just because pancreatic elastase is low once doesn't mean that it will always be low. So some patients can improve, some patients can't improve. Those that can, seems like dealing with inflammation or dealing with other abnormals in the report can be helpful and sometimes you do see pancreatic elastase improve. Those folks who don't improve on pancreatic elastase uh, may have something wrong with the pancreas, so that's why it's important to follow up. We also want to encourage this patient to adjust their eating habits, so skipping two meals and then just overeating at one meal is also not conducive to good digestive health. So some, some more balance there uh, could be helpful. Stress management, of course, um, we're always talking about that with our patients these days. And uh, we, you could follow up with a GI effects comprehensive in you know, a few months to check back in on things. I think a few other notes about this case because there's so much going on here. Uh, this is likely a patient who might need to be um, you know, pretty regular for the next uh, three to six months uh, in terms of scheduling with you to, to get more answers, to gauge clinical responses to, to interventions, and to monitor progress. So this is probably not a one-and-done type of patient. Uh, he had a lot going on, and um, he, he's going to require some ongoing management uh, generally. So I find it's helpful to set that expectation with patients um, uh, and, and when I see them is, is that it's, it's, it's not just you see me once and, and you're good, um, especially when there's cases like this where there's so much going on. I wanted to include uh, just a couple of slides briefly just to, to remind, uh, remind us all about some of the root causes for gastrointestinal distress. That could be food reactions, allergies, sensitivities, or intolerances, infections, um, toxins, medications. We see this a lot with antibiotics, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, acid blockers, um, others as well. Uh, nutrient insufficiencies, a poor diet can lead to some gut distress, systemic diseases, chronic inflammation, chronic stress, uh, GI surgical interventions, um, and extreme exercise. This is not an all-inclusive list, but I think it's helpful to just keep these in the back of your mind as reasons why somebody might present with GI distress. Lastly, before we get to our questions here, I wanted to mention that um, I think it's important anytime you order a lab test that you can trust the results. 
So this is a reminder about the quality measures that Genova takes to ensure that you can trust the results that you're getting, that you can rely on them to make decisions about your patients. So we take uh, multiple steps to ensure the accuracy of, of our assays. And uh, that includes participating in internal and external quality assurance programs. Um, and then of course, every regulatory uh, governing body, you know, we're compliant with those as well. So um, with that said, I will turn things back over to Dr. Powell. Um, let's see here. I got it. Thank you so you much. It? Okay, great. Yeah, no, I got it from here. Um, I just wanted to thank you. You know, that was really a great presentation and hopefully um, people understand, the participants are now understanding kind of how to look at these cases from kind of a different angle. I think that was such a great uh, presentation. Um, thank you. So we did receive quite a few clinical questions here, okay? Um, I just wanted to start with this one. So if a patient supplements with pancreatic enzymes um, to help with a low pancreatic elastase or PE1, will it show up or how will it show up in the results when you do a follow-up test, GI test? That's a good question. And I know you know the answer to this one, Lenore, as well. So, but uh, pancreatic elastase in stool is human specific. So it's not subject to influence from enzyme supplementation. So it's a true reflection of what the what the patient can make on their own. It may influence some of the results though. So you might see better fat digestion, better protein digestion. So it can influence those markers, but it shouldn't impact the pancreatic elastase at all. Another question we received was how important, it's more about collection. So how important is it to really stop probiotics two weeks prior to collection for the stool panel? That is also a, a good question. And probiotics could also influence some of the results, uh, but they won't interfere with our ability to run the test. So if you have a patient who you expect to see on probiotics for a long time, you know they're, they're sort of gonna be on that treatment plan for the long haul, or they say they feel so much better when they're on probiotics, then you might choose to keep them on that probiotic and test them anyway. The thing to remember there is that the healthy cohort ranges that you see on the commensal bacteria page were established for using a healthy cohort of patients who were not on probiotics. So you'd be comparing to reference ranges that were not supplemented with probiotics. So I think that's just the important thing to keep in mind. Uh, you might see that on a probiotic, a patient has uh, short chain fatty acid levels that look a little better or that the microbiome markers are a little more balanced. Um, so those would be things that could influence, but also not interfere. We have a few questions regarding SIBO testing. Uh, number one, if you can briefly review one hour versus, or I'm sorry, two hour versus three hour uh, breath test. Um, if you could review that first, and then when to consider a SIBO test first, versus a GI effectual panel first? <laughs> it's a, both good questions. So uh, we offer a two hour and a three hour SIBO test. The three hour SIBO test is ideal for patients who have slower transit time, who are more constipated, who tend towards constipation as their normal. That third hour allows you two extra breath specimens during that time, which give you, which we can help you extrapolate a little bit and they can help you account for a slower intestinal transit time. You, you imagine that lactulo solution that the patient drinks the challenge substance traveling through the GI tract. And if somebody is, has a slower transit time, that third hour could help you see or account for a slower transit time. Um, so that's uh, the first part of that question. Second part of that question about um, what was the second part of that question, Dr. Powell? Can you help me? TI versus SIBO testing. Which yeah, one goes that's right. That's, right. <laughs> that's right. Sorry. I'm, I'm holding up my blue snowball. I'm, I'm multitasking here. I so, got mine um, here too. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, so the uh, 
the, the you're starting with the GIFX or starting with a SIBO test? Uh, it's a good question. The I always think about testing in terms of what are the clinical questions that the test is going to answer for me about my patient, and the GIFX will cast a much wider net. So I think it's in my mind a great place to start. Um, if you have a patient that says that's that's just giving you all the signs of SIBO and you're pretty confident in the diagnosis and you're thinking about prescribing rifaximin or or you know some some form of SIBO treatment and uh, you and the patient are both you know on the same page there then maybe start with the SIBO test but I think most of the time uh, I'd say maybe eight out of ten times uh, nine out of ten times the GI effects in my mind is a is a better place to start. Yeah, just casting that wider net. I like the way that yeah. you put that. Um, in terms of treatment for SIBO, is there a difference in how you manage patients with methane dominant SIBO versus hydrogen dominant SIBO? Yes. Uh, so, a couple of things to keep in mind. So, for prescriptive agents, when it's just hydrogen dominant SIBO, then it's usually rifaximin. Uh, if it's if it's methane dominant or hydrogen and methane, you might consider rifaximin and neomycin or rifaximin and another antibiotic. So that seems to be important in treating methane SIBO with prescriptive agents. Natural agents, which can be as effective as uh, prescriptive agents according to published literature. Um, natural agents uh, look pretty similar, although often, with methane dominant SIBO, uh, something like allicin becomes important, which is the garlic extract, A L L I C I N. Um, Kibracho is another uh, natural antimicrobial that's often used with methane SIBO. So having those as part of the natural agent protocol can be helpful. I think also, usually with methane, we see patients who are more constipated, although not always. But if there's constipation, then something to address motility. And uh, that can be more important to do with a methane SIBO than with a uh, hydrogen type of SIBO. Usually hydrogen SIBOs are, are diarrhea predominant, loose stools. Um, in terms of the low FODMAP diet, you'd, you'd probably use those with both. I, I typically do. And um, uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, I think those are probably, the, that's probably a good, uh, overview of the difference between hydrogen and methane treatments. Awesome. I know it's one o'clock, but just one more question because I literally okay. received just now the same question two times. So let me just go ahead and ask it. So if a client Let's is on it. immunosuppressants or steroids, uh, which in which they cannot withdraw prior to testing, um, would you expect the inflammatory markers to be impacted? And for this specific client, they mentioned that they had a client recently and all inflammatory markers were within normal range, but they were also on those types of medications. So if you can address that briefly. Yeah, I've seen that, and I'm sure you have too, Dr. Powell, where patients on um, some kind of anti-inflammatory medication, and that's suppressing the inflammation in the gut, and you see uh, stool test markers for CalPro, EPX, maybe even fecal secretory IgA, where they're just all looking normal. So that that is something that's a pretty common thing to see. Um, it's it you know could be telling us that those medications are working to limit some of the inflammation. So in that way, you know there there could be some value to that to see how effective those anti anti inflammatories are. So uh, yes, you could, that could influence the inflammatory markers. Absolutely. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that, Dr. Powell? No, I think you answered it absolutely perfectly. Um, okay. You know just. Allowing people to understand that, again, if the elevation in calprotectin does actually remain while patients are on anti-inflammatory um, or uh, steroid or whatever type of medication that you do need to potentially revisit the current regimen that they're currently on. Um, and then, like you mentioned, we hopefully would see the levels very low if people are on those medications, because that would mean that um, it's at least helping to calm down um, the inflammation part of 
their symptoms. But um, in the interest of time, we just, unfortunately, everybody, I'm so sorry. We have to end our question and answer period there. For additional education materials, you can always visit our website at www.gdx.net. And on this site, you're going to find things like sample reports, kit instructions, information about each of our profiles. And after taking advantage of those materials on the website, you can contact customer service with additional questions. Um, you'll see a contact number here on the slide in just a moment. Um, and you can give them a call, ask whatever questions you have. You can schedule medical education, complimentary appointments to either answer questions regarding interpretation of the test or helping to decide which test to consider ordering for your patients. And we definitely would like to encourage you register for our upcoming webinars. Um, they're always found on www.gdx.net. And I really hope everybody has a wonderful day. And I just want to Again, thank Dr. Brown for such a wonderful presentation. As he mentioned in his presentation, you know, we're doing live uh, daily events on Facebook, on Instagram. We have a podcast. So please stay tuned and engage with us. Everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.